And on today's broadcast of It's Art, Let's Talk About It, I'm with my good friend and a wonderful sculptor, Jason Skull. And welcome to the podcast, Jason. Thank you, Daryl. And this is going to be, for those of you listening, our very first podcast. We decided to kick it off with a very special friend and a guy who's been a member of the museum's world for a long time and today serves as the artist in residence for the program. We thought that would be an appropriate way to talk about, to start off our conversation with uh, for this podcast. And so, welcome to the show. Thank you, Daryl. It's good Just to be here. Talk about how you got started with sculpting. Did you always know you were going to be a sculptor? Oh, no, not at all. So, my, my journey, of course, began like many did, that was through the encouragement of our, my mother primarily, not my dad so much. I grew up in a farming and ranching family, and that was not... Art was not looked at as a pursuit, but rather a pastime. And, but my mother was very good about seeing her children's interests and feeding those interests, whatever they may be, mine being art. I could always expect books and art materials, birthdays and Christmas, and in that sense that I was supported in that. And you already know the story about my my venture into higher education when my father asked me, I said, son, what are you going to study when you go to college? I said, gee, dad, I want to be an architect. He said, no. He said, what you want to be is you want to be a veterinarian. So I was an animal science major at Texas A&M for (laughs) a couple of years. And at one point, my father became critically ill. My my two older brothers were both otherwise occupied. So I, I left school and returned to the ranch and did that for a number of years. And the circuitous route our lives take at times takes us in strange places. And it was in January of 1987. I, a friend of mine had never been to this museum and wanted to go. I was living in San Marcos at the time, where, the, where I'd grown up. And we came over. It was Sunday afternoon, back in the days when the museum was open on Sundays. He walked into the main gallery, and I walked into the library for whatever reason. And for whatever reason, I asked the person in attendance in the library, I said, don't you offer professional level workshops? And she said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, in March, we're going to have a sculpture workshop. I said, well, it's too bad I'm too late to apply. She said, oh, but you're not. <laughs> and thus my road into sculpture began. I'd always done dimensional things as a child. And so sculpture wasn't just an afterthought. It was something that I had pondered and Got into the class, and it was quite a quite an amazing scenario because there were five instructors. It was Grant Speed, Bill Owen, Bill Nebaker. Basically an introduction to sculpture. I couldn't have fallen into a better situation, and that just launched my adventure. What year was that? 87. 1987, yeah, a few years, years after. 36 years ago. A few years after the museum opened. What, four years after. And it was hosted here at the museum? Here at the museum. It was actually hosted at Lions Camp because of the number of people involved. And it was, of course, before the pavilion. And they, I think in the early years of the workshop program here at the museum, they held it in the workroom. Right. Because there was room for classes at that time, small classes, up to 10 to 20 people could 20 could squeeze in there, 10 could definitely fit very well. So I think the early Joe Beeler and Jim Boren classes and even Melvin Warren and, and Harvey Johnson taught, taught one together that I think those were held in the back room. Those five sculptors, though, my yeah, goodness, that's a who's who. It was at the time. still is. You think I mean, about it. Those, they're still those, the greats, yeah, yeah. Those were the greats of the, you know, Grant had joined the CA probably in 1968, I think. So in the very early days of that organization and had traveled through the, the glory days of Western art. And, I, and the others had too, as far as that goes. And I still maintain a close friendship with Mel Lawson. He and I have remained great friends and we speak quite often. He visited the museum recently. Yeah, this, just this last, when was it? Yeah. Do you recall? Last fall, yeah. Last fall, yeah, family reunion. Yeah. It was so, always good to see him uh, yeah. and some of these greats that you talk about. Of those 95 students that were in that class, any go on well, other than you, you know, to make a living? Bruce Green was in the class. Was he really? That's where I met Bruce and Tim Cox. And Phil Bob Borman was in that class. Really? Kirk Matson. And, you know, those are the ones that All are great st- artists, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're still involved, each one of them in their own way. Matson and I are probably the two that would remain in sculpture primarily. Uh, yeah. The others being primarily painters. And... 
most of the work that you do, cowboys, you do horses. That's, Is that that's, your love? That's, that's what I was interested in from childhood. You know, it's what I grew up around. Right. Cat, cattle and horses, and, and I enjoy the idea of regional work and denoting some of the culture we, we have here in Texas. I like to do Hispanic self, subject matter and because they're the, the Spanish settled Texas in the early part of the 1700s. San Antonio was, what, 1720 or something yeah. like that. And the South Texas and the Lower Rio Grande Valley was opened up in about 1740s. That, that influence is huge as far as our culture is concerned, collectively. One of the things that you do on a regular basis on, not FaceTime, but Instagram, is right. Mentor Monday, Mentor yeah, occasionally. Yeah, I've run out of I've run out of those who. But influenced. let's talk about some of those mentors real yeah, quickly. Yeah. I think probably the greatest influence <coughs> on me was Jack Swanson, and Jack taught a workshop here in 1987 in May, 36 years ago this month. And Jack and I became good friends, and he invited me to come and spend time with him in his studio in California. And I went out for a number of years, spending a week or two at a time there with Jack. And uh, his interest in the early California vaquero, the Spanish vaquero of that region, just that kind of colored the path which I eventually took. And uh, what well, didn't eventually take, I, I, that was the trail I was on all along. Who are the other mentors you mentioned? Of course, there's Mel Lawson and uh, Cynthia Rigdon. Cynthia was a sculptor of cattle and horses, lived in central Arizona and on a family ranch that they'd had since uh, 1907. And uh, probably learned more from her about sculpting cattle than anybody. And Mel, of course, Mel was a huge influence in directing my steps technically as far as constructing horses and figures and understanding their proportion and making sure that relationship was good because when you create a piece of art, it needs to be believable, and especially in the traditional Western realm that I work in. One of the people that I've heard you mention often, and I had the pleasure of knowing briefly, course is Don Hitch. Oh, absolutely. Talk about Don for just a second. Don was one of the first. I uh, I sought Don out back in the uh, about 87 or 88 because of his interest in South Texas and I really became aware of that in the forward to a book he had written or a, an essay he'd written for a catalog of work by Joe Beeler that was a show held at the Institute of Texan Cultures and they published a catalog with it. And his it was called In the Cradle of the Cattle Kingdom, and it was related to South Texas and, and the cow and horse cultures that we have here. And I realized here was someone that spoke more or less the same language or the language I was hoping to speak, if you will. And I called Don up one day. He lived here in Kerrville. Don had a varied career. He, I think right out of college, he taught English here in Kerrville, Texas. He grew up near Kingsville, but from here he went to Oklahoma, where he worked for the Oklahoma Cattlemen Association and was editor of their monthly publication. And from there, he went to the Cowboy Hall of Fame, where he was their, uh, not art director, but he was the founding editor of Persimmon Hill Magazine, right. which was the official publication of them. From there, he went to the Buffalo Bill in Cody, Wyoming, and starting out as the director of the Western Art Collection and became the director of the whole right. shooting match by the time he, before he left. And was wooed to come back to Texas and was founding director of the Haley Memorial Library in Midland before he moved back to Kerrville in right. the, probably in the early 80s and settled here with his wife, Shug. And I was fortunate and blessed that your friendship allowed me an introduction to sure. him because I had, had grew up in the Western art world. And when if you grew up in the Western art world, you read a lot and you read those books and you keep seeing the same names, a lot of the same names. And his was one of those been awe. So know. many people would not understand or realize that Don wrote, I, I can't begin to n name the number of books he wrote. There were biographies of Western artists, a lot of the CA guys, Bettina Stanky, Robert Lockheed. Bettina was not a member, of course, but right. just uh, it was beyond, just beyond the CA itself. So he, he was a giant in the field of... I'm not Western very art. speechless very often, but going to his home and getting invited uh, back uh, to the... Back, back to his, back to his inner, inner sanctum. It was yeah, just right. speechless moment well, for me. Not, you know, one of those, not many people got that invitation. I just kind of, and I talked about it to a lot of people over the yeah. years year since his passing. Well, I, Don was very, had a great understanding of design and composition and subject matter and because of what I did we had this kinship that 
we really enjoyed each other's company and he would I'd take pieces over for him to look at we'd discuss them and what if you did this or what if you did that kind of scenarios and but Don had as much influence on me as any graphic or any visual artist let's talk about the current exhibition that's up at the Museum of Western Art 40 years of Western art work one of your works in the exhibition out where the wild ones run yes and uh, let's talk about that piece for just a second. What do you want to talk what about? What do you say? Okay. Right? I, think I think it is o- one honestly, of the best things I've done. So. I, honestly, I think it is. And How it's hard, follow that? hard for an artist to say that, but one of your latest pieces is also the piece that represents you as one of the leaders and shakers of the last 40 years. And you're in the same show with some of those, Ben, you mentioned. Absolutely. From 36 years ago. That has to be all in it's, it's, it's we must stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, any of us. Yeah. And who were the influences in our lives and, as you said, mentors? Who shaped us or how were we shaped? We were shaped by our environment and yeah. those we came in contact with. One of the things that you have done for the past several years is be an instructor at the Western Art Academy. Shriner University has a, a, an academy. I'm that a glutton for punishment. 40, 40 students. 60, 48. 48 students. Yeah. And they switch off and do two weeks of sculpture, two weeks of... But, but talk about that opportunity to teach young sculptors well, new... Mind, well, of it? course, this is a program through the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo Art Contest. And what an opportunity for these young people, 17, 18 years old. I'm not sure they realize, and of course they don't realize the magnitude of what they're being exposed to. But yet later in life, they, they will. Well, I've seen a couple of them in various magazines as the top 20 under 30 years old. Yeah, there have been, been, been a few, few of those I mean, graduates. Over so. the years, and it's like anything Professional sports is a good example as far as I'm concerned. You can have a a good high school player that goes on, and he may or may not be a good college player. But those that end up in the pro levels, that is just such a thin layer of cream on the top of that, that, that jug of milk, if you will. That they, But you've got to have that opportunity for them. And that's what's so great about the Western Art Academy is it is an opportunity. And I, I can name a few that I can feel like I, we've really touched them. I'm lucky, too, to have to teach that many kids in a four-week program. You can't do it alone, and I'm so glad, uh, lucky to be able to teach with Eric Slocum, uh, yeah. another friend of the museum. And Eric's going to be in a future podcast yeah. for It's Art. Let's talk about it, along with Bill Colwick, sure. and we'll get uh, Brandon Bailey, who taught. Yeah, who taught with us a couple of years. Yeah. He's a big friend of the museum and, and all that. Let's talk about the future of Western art. A uh, tough subject, but is there one? Of course. How, does, well, how do we make it through those giants? The thing is we all have to look at is Russell, as the grandfather of Western art, if you will, painted what and sculpted what he knew and of the time he, he lived. So to, to deal with a contemporary subject, the cowboy or cowboy of today, we see a lot of people doing historic work but so much of that is not. We're having to go on research and what limited information there is available to to create works that are historic, whereas if we're working in a contemporary sense, that subject matter's still here. There's still cowboys out there doing it. Now, the market for Western art has changed significantly just for the reason that that our times have changed. the, those people that bought in the 70s and 80s had been exposed to, to Western subject matter on television through Gunsmoke and Raw High Wagon Train. There were so many, excuse me, <coughs> so many things that stirred the imagination in a Western sense. People love that idea. It's just, and it's still, I think there's a lot of truth to that, or the individualism, the rugged individualism that uh, the West personifies, if you will, the, um, the lone horseman, his work. Even and those that are coming together to work as a organized group is in ranch crews that would go out together horseback, each one off to a different section of the pasture and responsible for right. bringing in cattle and so forth. But I think there will always be those who love the West, those who are moved and stirred by that iconography that that brings them pleasure by having it around them. But just to, to live with a piece of art is is an honor for a lot of people, to be able to have that be part of their everyday, to either have it 3D form or 2D form, 
just to, to enhance their lives, to bring something, a richness to the tapestry of their lives. I think that is, is what art should do. It should enrich a person in their experience in life. One of the quotes on your walls is good art and bad art. There's only art. There's only art. Yeah, right? There is no bad, such thing. but it's still art. Still yeah, just art. Yeah. And we've, I've often mentioned to artists, this is the only profession in the world where you can say, I am, and, and you, are. you are. Therefore, yeah, you yeah. are. And yet the talent, the quality still has to find its way. But, there's a yeah. lot of really good, great, wonderful artists, and then there's a lot who are not. And yet they're still artists. There's, well, they're, still, yeah. they're viable. Yeah. These there are people out there that are, have successful careers that may not be as good artists as others, but they're great markets and their personality helps to win people over. One of the things that is coming up in, in your life and for the life of the museum is the workshop. Right. You've taught many workshops here at the museum over the years. This year in September, yeah. we're going to be teaching another workshop. And for those of you listening, can you say, how do I sign up? Call and get your name on the list because your workshop sold out um, yeah, months ago. In months ago, yeah. right after we announced it, so that's got to be an interesting. Well, it's a humbling thing to yeah, say. There's that many people out there who immediately sign up to take a Jason yeah. School workshop. It is humbling. It just it just is the fact. The other humbling aspect I wanted to get to a little earlier was the fact that people that buy art, it's for the artist. It's a, it's an ultimate honor to have somebody take something home that's part of them. But and to get back again to the workshop, yeah, the, my, my issue, not my issue, my, my feelings about the workshop are the fact that I was given so much early on in my career through that opportunity. I think it, it is, it's a responsibility of any artist who's been gifted by mentorship and the experience of taking workshops to give back. And you've had a few students in your workshops who have gone on to begin making a name on their own right. Sure. And a couple of them even have participated in the annual roundup here right. that I feel as a museum director, they've come far enough that they're able to yeah. be a and part of that. They're, they're, and it's, and that's such, a, that's such a, a tricky thing right now for young artists coming up to, to have a venue or an outlet for right. their work to be seen. There's limited venues. Yeah, I think it's more yeah. difficult now than it was 36 years ago when I got started. There were quite a few smaller shows. We didn't have the internet, but th there were opportunities in far-flung states to go and show your work if if you were accepted into the shows. And the same is held true today, but there's just fewer shows, and they're a little more difficult. You get some of the big shows like the Prix de West and the Autry show and even this show. It's just it's not open to the world. One of the things that is the elephant in the room when they talk about Jason Skull is that you used to be a member of the Cowboy Artist of America. Former member. Former member, and I, I don't mean to put you on the spot about that because – you're not the only one who's been a former oh, sure. member of this it's a wonderful organization. But uh, my good friend Bob Pummel, former member Absolutely. of the CA, and there are others. Oh, the numbers are. Yeah, who've been amazing. in that group. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the Cowboy Artist of America. Talk about standing on the shoulders of giants. Some of those guys, the Bill Nebuchers of the world, just incredible to have been a part well, of a group. Well, you know, Bill's been an uh, active member of that organization for over 40 years. Which, but just as long he got in the early '70s, and he's still active. He's their senior member now. Oh, without a doubt. And then one of the young people that we've talked about, and we've gotten to know real well, is Brandon Bailey. Sure. There's forty some odd years in difference between uh, the senior member in Bill Nebaker oh, sure. and the junior member in and a future podcast coming up. We talked to Jack Sorensen, is a CA member, one of the newest CA members, right. and had that conversation about the future of the CA and the history. And I think that's what he, he has the same kind of feeling you do about it. And that is he's, he was honored to be chosen and Absolutely. just to be a part of that group. And you had some really good times, but there are people out there who want to want to know well, why. There comes a time when you determine the fact that you're better off grazing away from the herd. There you go. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's, it just got burdensome yeah. for me. And we hear that a lot from former members, is that sometimes being a part of that organization is laborious. It's, it just requires so much There's so time. much. Yeah, so much yeah. of your energy, so much of your time. And sometimes no, it's, you got to break off a, into your own thing. It's a fabulous organization. I, just, I idolize some of those early members like Joe Beeler and Bill Moyers and Jack Swanson and Snido and Ed, Ed, Bill yeah. Owen. And you just, but those guys, too, in turn, they... Learned from those that came before him, too. Yeah. Just Joe Beeler was a protege of 
Oh, no, I can't think. Who is the one that Charlie Russell took under his wing? You know the answer. Jody Young. Jody Young, yeah. yeah. He knew Joe in Los Angeles. Yeah. He was going to Los Angeles School of Design, I think, at the time, and befriended Jody Young and just uh, was – I think that probably played a big part in, in Joe's formative years yeah. as far as the way his direction he took. When you, you take Bill Moyers as an example, who mm-hmm. studied under Harold Von Schmidt, who studied under Harvey Dunn, who studied under Howard Pyle, and Harvey Dunn was a classmate with N.C. Wyeth, those great illustrators of the early days. And that's where Western art is based, is in that storytelling genre that's of a, illustration. This also sounds like a, 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 not an admonishment, but an advice to a young person getting ready to consider going into the field, study with the good people. Absolutely, yeah. Find those artists that you admire well, and those I, works. And, exactly, and that's the advice I've given some of these young people through the Western Art Academy. Find those people you admire, the things about their work you admire, and don't be afraid to approach people because they can be some of your greatest allies in your journey in this Western art adventure you're on. What's next for Jason Skull? What's next for Jason Skull? Mm -hmm. I ask artists all the time, have you gotten your favorite piece? And it's always the next one, right? That's what Jim Norton had told some. No, that was... uh, See, my age is starting yeah, to show go. on that, me. Gary Carter. Gary Carter Someone said, asked Carter one time, they said, what's the best thing you've ever done, Carter? And he stopped and looked at him. He said, the next one's always. That's, it, it should be. And sometimes you'll, you'll hit one that is just, you wonder how you'll ever exceed that. I think that's where I am with the, out where the wild ones run. But I do know that it will come. How do people out there listening to the podcast who may not know a lot about Jason Skull find out more about you? JasonSkull.com? Oh, uh, sure. Is that the website? As, as, as poorly a designed website as that is, <laughs> yes. Or they can always call the Museum of Western yeah, and ask. Come, come a, visit with me in my shack out back. Yeah. The shack out back. One of the things that we're always going to be, I'm always going to be happiest about in my career is that you and I met many years ago. Oh, my gosh. And, I don't even want to guess how. And how uh, it's either. been fun. And this is our first sit-down interview podcast. And so that's why I wanted it to be number one. Ah, uh, you can only go uphill from here. You can only, only go uphill that's from right, right here. Yeah. So our guest today has been Jason Skull. And uh, it's that simple, Jason. It's just a conversation. Yeah. We, we titled this, It's Art, Let's Talk About It. And to some, I think we have. Some level, that's what we did. Yeah, so. some level. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks.